Uh, our next speaker joining from Fireside Chat is about the changing perceptions in and around blockchain. Um, the, the thing is that uh, Matthew Rozak is an investor, right? He's uh, got a lot of experience in investing in Tally Capital uh, before it was even considered fashionable. He's also chairman and co-founder of Block Inc., where they're building some of the solutions and building the technology of the blockchain for, the, for both infrastructure and applications. But he also gives his time as chairman of that venerable institution, the Chamber of Commerce. Now, you might say, what has the Chamber of Commerce got to do with blockchain? Well, a heck of a lot. It's actually called the Token Alliance at the Digital Chamber of Commerce. I'm so excited that the Chamber of Commerce has a token alliance. This is new news to me and terrific. It's almost cool. Uh, where, so he and his colleagues there are working hard to produce things like white papers to help regulators understand more about this uh, and policymakers because they have to, right? So please welcome Matthew Rozak. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, so, um, you don't know I'm going to ask you this, because, but our conversation led me to it. From being the money launderer's weapon of choice to today, okay, what is that change that is taking place, and is it still the money launderer's weapon of choice? Uh, well, just to clarify that, I, I, less than 1% of you know, nefarious activities used with Bitcoin or there's a lot more with cash, I know. A lot more with cash and duffel bags and, and what have you. Uh, that research is, uh, has been covered. Uh, but I think the, the narrative uh, continues to change and evolve. And I think uh, you've got a lot of themes going on here. You have um, tech uh, and the innovations that, that are happening, everything from Satoshi's white paper to launch of Bitcoin to Ethereum and kind of the Cambrian explosion of, of tokenization. Uh, but you still are, are missing a lot of the narrative of what is Bitcoin, why do I need it, uh, the, the form factors, the, the UI, UX, the, the applications where it's kind of invisible, it's just working underneath. I mean, it's incredibly hard to use this stuff at the moment, yeah. right? I, I, I've, you know, over the last few years, I, I keep telling you know, friends and family, like trying to manage your own Bitcoin wallet is like trying to flay your own blowfish. You're, go you're gonna hit the wrong gland, and things will go horribly wrong. Uh, I love you know, that. Fa fast forward a few years, you know, uh, you have Coinbase, you have uh, you have uh, hardware wallets, you have better uh, user interfaces, you have Exodus, and and a whole slew of new uh, applications. Abra, a uh, lot of improvement. Can we talk about these building blocks? I think that's the right term for them. What will they bring us in the blockchain economy or token economy? Uh, a lot. Uh, I, I think, obviously, Big uh, uh, yeah. There's just so so much to unpack there. I, I you know, obviously, pick the, one, pick something. The, the advent of money, identity, uh, new layers of the internet. Uh, you know, what what I uh, like seeing is uh, even uh, you know uh, what Definity just uh, raised uh, 100 million plus dollars to do a decentralized uh, Amazon Web Services. So every layer of Amazon, uh, whether it's you know compute, storage, access, database, uh, all those layers will be. Uh, reimagined, decentralized. decentralized, and then provisioned in a new way. Uh, so uh, that adds a whole new layer to build stuff that's not necessarily centralized or reliant on, on things that could be uh, you know, censored or tampered. Okay, let's um, switch, because this is an investing conference, so quite keen to know what are your, what's your favorite investments, and what do you think now with the benefit of 2020 hindsight might not have been the best bets, or what's hot and what's not? Uh, well, starting this space, um, uh, I, I started out uh, networking with people. You know, we, we, we uh, see pitch decks and white papers and, uh, and all these promises, but at the end of the day, you, you still have to execute, still have to build this stuff, still have to, uh, and, and, it's, and it is a skill set that is, that is not uh, within one particular uh, entrepreneur in this space. Uh, it's somebody's, um, uh, distributed amongst, uh, you know, build the tech, raise capital, and then go to market. We've been doing a lot of white papering and raising capital, but in terms of exercising the technology and then going to market, having users, transactions, throughput, uh, et cetera, and seeing that flywheel of the blockchain turn, uh, that's still uh, a bit elusive for us. Um, but starting out, uh, you know, like most people still do today, you start with Bitcoin. 
And, you know, I, I uh, got into Bitcoin, uh, learned about it in 2011, got into it by 2012, 2013. And did you, you buy some then? I did. Good absolutely. Uh, I, the, the first moment I, I learned about it, it was uh, silly magic internet money and I discounted it. It took me about a year to kind of pick it apart. And as I was picking it apart, I, uh, I kind of got, uh, you, know, uh, you know, saw the light, uh, if you will, and, uh, and couldn't put it down. Uh, but what, what happens sometimes uh, is you, you get these maximalism tendencies to say, oh, uh, this is it. And you might miss Ethereum, and then well, Ethereum is it, and then you might miss an EOS. And so I think that this this journey is uh, a bit serial, and and it's all kind of um, uh, it compounds off itself. But it's interesting you say that because the industry is quite competitive, right? In that it, people are asking us uh, what is going to win, but they don't ask that in regular tech investing. So so why are people so obsessed with what is going to win? What's you always, you always want to go with what's going to win, what's the gold, what's the, uh, the market leader, and then, you know, it's the uh, early bird gets the worm, mouse gets the cheese. You, you have all these sayings in this space. Uh, the, the interesting part about uh, this space, and, and this is the part that I'm not sure about, where uh, you have Ethereum developers, and they kind of look across the street, and they see Quantum, or they see Polkadot, or EOS, or... Uh, another uh, blockchain that looks interesting. And instead of just, you know, I, I don't know if developers are going to be tribal and say, you know what, I'm a, a Cubs fan. I'm not going to go and root for the, you know, the Red Sox or something and, and stay ingrained in that. Or will they kind of move like bees and, 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 and birds uh, from uh, project to project? And how will the connective tissue, the compiling of, of the, the blockchains uh, talk to each other and make that a lot easier? Uh, which I think will be the case over time, but over the near term, it'll be interesting how those, those hearts and minds, the, the attention span of these developers gets captured, and it gets captured better now than ever before because you have these, these token incentives. And so that'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But you, I mean, your portfolio, portfolio is pretty awesome. It includes, includes certain things like uh, Binance, uh, Qtum. You know, these are pretty serious players, and some of your investments are, they do overlap quite a bit, right? So, yeah, I, 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 I mean, so, so here's the, uh, it, it's like being a maximalist would be, uh, uh, I think, a bad thing in retrospect. And, and some of this was, um, uh, it helped me learn what was happening. Helped me learn, uh, firstly, how to connect with these communities, how to connect with the best entrepreneurs and, and developers and technologists. And that was the biggest piece, because it's still a people-driven space. It has you know, the, the best white paper, the best website, the best GitHub repository, fantastic. But this is a movie, it's not a static picture, and you have to continue to, to innovate and raise your game. Because you know, we're seeing you know, uh, $100 million financings, we'll see billion dollar financings uh, more and more uh, over the next several years. Uh, which gives entrepreneurs capacity to win hearts and minds, go to market better, and this is all open source. So they could take pieces of Ethereum and Quantum and EOS and and kind of put together a puzzle that's uh, with some innovation on top of that that could be maybe better, more scalable, more secure. Uh, so so uh, being a maximalist or, or picking a winner yeah. is really hard to do. I think um, uh, what I was fortunate to, to, to do early days was uh, was meet a lot of these technologists, and I had you know lots of dinners, and I'd go to a conference like this, uh, and and invite you know 20, 30 people to dinner, and you know some of the early dinners were you know uh, CZ at Binance and Charlie Lee at Litecoin, and uh, you know uh, Bobby Lee at BTC China, and those compounded into more and more relationships that helped me ascertain what. Uh, was happening in the space, whose white paper was interesting, and who's got the, the chops to execute. Uh, but we're still really early in this space. We're, we're still, uh, you know, the, the stone ages of, of crypto uh, today. Well, um, you mentioned the, the Lee family, and of course we're going to hear from Bobby uh, as well a bit later, because uh, a lot of people are quite interested to see what he's up to. Uh, but back then, he was running something like the second largest exchange in China. That in itself is quite a big thing. What's your view on exchanges? Do you invest in them? And how important will they be going forward to investors? I think that the nature of exchanges uh, in this space is important. Creates, uh, we're seeing the, the dynam dynamics of uh, uh, you know, coinmarketcap.com. You, you go on there, you see the volume, you see the throughput, and uh, I'm not a trader in this space. I'm an investor, so I invest and, and hold. 
Uh, but uh, you see a lot of investing, a lot of throughput, and, and she, Wall Street's not even in this yet, this game. This is all a different uh, uh, ecosystem we, today. We'll come back to Wall Street. I just want to actually ask you a question so people could, could understand. There's investors here, and they've said to us, um, you know, people are offering me tokens, not equity. Do you invest in tokens as well as equity? Absolutely. I, I first started out in investing in, in a, uh, about 23 companies, so a lot of the bridges, roads, and tunnels of the space. So uh, Coinbase, Kraken, um, uh, BTC China, uh, wallets, payment processors, exchanges, miners. Right. Uh, and then uh, after MasterCoin and, and uh, MadeSafe and Factum and Ethereum and this whole kind of explosion that happened over the last yeah. couple of years, uh, invested in a lot of these, these new tokenized networks. Uh, and that gave me interesting mental models and what's, uh, where the heat map was forming in this space, um, still a lot of work to do. You know, there's, there's uh, very limited advantages in this space, um, except for network effects, hash power, and market cap like Bitcoin has, like the uh, crowdfunding that Ethereum has, has driven, and uh, you know, I would say really bright lights and, and uh, great energy coming out of EOS. Um, uh, absent that, uh, the, you know, everybody else has a lot of work to do in terms of finding utility and the go-to-market. You um, didn't mention Tether, uh, and also I'm quite interested in what you think about Bitcoin Cash, right? Because that recently passed its uh, first serious scaling tests in a network that wasn't entirely controlled by them, which is pretty cool. So does that put Bitcoin Cash on your, on your radar? I mean, I think it's all like, you know, uh, sometimes look at Litecoin as a real money experiment for Bitcoin to kind of see what's happening there. And then in a more steady state, you know, absorb some of those uh, uh, technologies like, you know, pizza boxes stacking on top of Bitcoin or other other networks. Um, uh, Bitcoin Cash has just innovated on a more rapid pace uh, and are trying new things. Uh, I think over time you, you have Bitcoin with an RSK and other things that uh, will be extended and scale it more. Um, not, not that I'm saying, oh, it's, it's Bitcoin uh, or nothing, but I, I, don't, I don't see a Bitcoin just being a, a blunt knife store of, of uh, value. A value. I yeah. see it, you know, uh, innovations happening on top of it, you know, kind of like a totem pole of, of, of different, uh, different layers. Um, I have so many questions to ask you, but I'm going to save some of them for the panel. just want people to know that we're going to go to some Q&A soon, and so the time to think of any questions is this is the investor's investor, right? Uh, think about all of that portfolio that we've just heard about. If you ever want to ask some questions, this is one. So uh, when, when we do go to questions, we'll ask for the lights to be turned up a bit so I can actually see you. Catch my eye. There will be microphone folk uh, microphone ninjas around, so get yourselves ready. Uh, wave your hand if you have that question, and um, let, let's make sure we get this. Uh, we will do Q&A on this panel, but then we'll go to the, um, the, the uh, general Q&A, where you'll get a chance to ask Jennifer Zhu Scott as well. I'm sorry we didn't have time, but you'll definitely get a chance uh, on the panel as well. So could you tell us about uh, BitGive? What's yeah, so, so, so BitGive is the first charity in the, the blockchain and crypto space. Uh, Connie Gallippi founded it and uh, probably served on her board. Uh, and so uh, taking Bitcoin donations and giving it to, uh, to great causes. Uh, the other twist to that is uh, BitGive has also uh, been doing some dog fooding, which means using blockchain technology to uh, track and trace uh, uh, donations, meaning uh, you know, we, transparency. We, right? Transparency. We we hear about this in supply chain, where you know, seed to sale and and the whole uh, supply chain workflow all on a blockchain. Uh, the real issue there is actually trade finance, not tracking and tracing uh, for for that industry. Um, but in in the case of BitGive, if you see your dollar coming in and you could track and trace it down to the hammer, the nails, the the, the school that's getting built and uh, you have better visibility in, into that workflow, you will wind up giving more. At least that's the bet. Uh, and so th this is the early kind of stage in kind of transforming uh, giving and, and having better accountability on that. Um, personally, in the future, I don't ever want to give money to a charity where the quality mark for transparency will be that it's powered by blockchain and that I can actually see where every cent goes. It just makes so much sense to me. Yeah, I mean, uh, we see these statistics, oh, 96% goes to the cause or 89, you know, it's like, and, and you trust it, but you can't really verify it. it. And so if you know that to a certain degree, uh, you're gonna wind up giving more, at least, at least I would. No, that, that's true. What, what do you think of the current state of enterprise blockchain? 
a uh, lot of uh, dust getting kicked up, lot, and, and and you know you look at the flight path of, of of enterprise with new tech and internet, cloud, and and even blockchain. You you have uh, you know in in the internet days they didn't go on the internet. They built intranets and extranets, and, and then finally you know got onto the uh, to the open internet uh, with uh, you know applications and stuff. Same thing with the cloud. They start with the hybrid cloud because the data cannot be anywhere but in our firewall. That changed, and so all that stuff started melting down because uh, there's some of their issues are actually their advantages, where they have these great brands that they're trying to protect. They have this regulatory arbitrage that they're that they're sensitive to, and they have these networks that they want to protect. Mm -hmm. And actually, those are their advantages today, uh, kind of going top down in building networks and everything else, versus what's happening with all these new decentralized layers and technologies that are going bottom up. And so, uh, you know, you, you see a lot of uh, headlines on B3I on insurance and R3 on banking, and, and you, you, you see everybody getting around a table and trying to uh, figure out how to use this technology. And, and I think it's super important for those organizations to do that because they're, they're telling and training uh, big companies that move generally pretty slow what this technology is, what it isn't, and how to... Uh, basically save money because because most of those those endeavors are cost reduction strategies and and kind of it goes from cost reduction to growth to maybe innovation but the minute uh, you have any IP or innovation or anything of consequence that will that, that's like a growth factor I think everybody will will leave that room because you've been stealing my customers for 20 years I've been stealing your employees for 20 years and so you know we're not going to just you know collaborate to, you know, uh, to do something uh, on, a, on a growth basis. I think it's, you know, uh, a, a super important step stone to get them to see uh, these, these, these new uh, solutions, applications, and ultimately tokenized networks. Because for Block, um, you know, we have Block Enterprise and Block Labs yeah. and Block Enterprise. People are like, oh, you're dealing with, um, you're building blockchain solutions for, for enterprise. And uh, we're not. If, if somebody wants to... Um, uh, mitigate time and cost and uh, business process or workflow. Um, I, I, I very happily tell them to call Accenture, Deloitte, and IBM. They will do a great job of, of handling that. If an enterprise, and, and we our customers are Crypto50 and Fortune50, if, right. if somebody wants to engage in a tokenized network, then that's where we shine. Uh, and what's interesting is um, the Fortune 50 are just start. It's a smaller pool, yeah. a lot of blockchain action, but in terms of enterprise dealing with crypto, it's a smaller, more condensed pool. But that's where that's where we kind of uh, navigate through. And what the other thing that's interesting is there's a new enterprise customer on the field. It's called the Crypto 50, and that's uh, a bit main, a circle, a quantum. These are companies engaging uh, in this space that have plumbing but don't have the porcelain and a lot of the other components to engage in, in other uh, areas uh, with even these, these, these Fortune 50 companies. So, uh, and we like dealing with the crypto 50 companies because uh, uh, they're not budget sensitive, they make quick decisions, and it's an interesting dynamic. Um, but let's not, let's not you know, um, this is not to say that the, the Fortune 50 are gonna get steamrolled. No. You know, we, we've seen this in an uh, in enterprise where SAP and, and uh, Oracle said, oh, cloud, is just a cheaper delivery mechanism, right? And and uh, that was 15 years ago. You know, hundred billion dollars of M&A later, SAP and Oracle are cloud companies. They are right? cloud companies. So we'll That's see. What, what, what interesting in this space is we'll see uh, that happen. I think in a similar way, but the competition for that won't just be financial services companies buying crypto blockchain companies. There'll be tech companies competing for that as well. So okay. that'll, that'll be the difference. Uh, thank Matthew for helping us there.